Introducing today's speakers uh, is certainly uh, a challenge. Describing their life accomplishments could easily fill the hour. Our first comments will come from Mr. Lawrence Dark, the President and CEO of the Urban League of Portland since 1994. Mr. Dark is closely involved as well with the national efforts of the Urban League and additionally, he is presently working on a three-year national project with the Charles F. Kettering Foundation entitled Community Leadership, Community Change Through Public Action, probably a title we should have used for today's program. Lawrence Dark is a Denison University graduate and alumni award recipient, and he also attended and graduated from Northwestern's uh, School of Law in Chicago. He is a senior fellow of Oregon's chapter of the American Leadership Forum, and he has shown his leadership skills constantly, locally, and nationally, and has collected a list of honors, I can assure you, that are far too numerous, numerous to tell you about today. Our second speaker is Rabbi Emmanuel Rose, and he has been the senior rabbi at Portland's distinguished congregation Beth Israel since 1960. He's been a dynamic force in the greater Portland community and has frequently been found in the center of important social and political causes. He graduated from the University of Cincinnati and Hebrew Union College, where his doctoral dissertation was entitled Jews and Judaism in Vatican II. He is the present chair of the Oregon Board of Rabbis and a member of the National Committee on Social Action of Reform Judaism. His past affiliations, responsibilities, and, and honors, again, <clears throat> are much too lengthy for me to tell you about in detail. David Reinhardt, our final speaker, is an associate editor of The Oregonian. He has been writing editorials and columns, mostly with a conservative slant, since 1987. In 1991 and 92, he received Best Editorial Awards from the Oregon Newspaper Publishers Association. Before coming to Oregon, Mr. Reinhardt worked as a staff assistant and then as a special assistant in the Department of Energy in the Reagan administration. His education was at Albright College in Reading, Pennsylvania and at Pennsylvania State University from which he received a Master's of Arts degree and also a PhD in history. He's written a book entitled The Republican Right Since 1945. All three of these men have families in Oregon and the community issues surrounding our diverse society are important to each of them. They will comment on race relations in Portland from their own perspectives and then field your questions. Please welcome with me Lawrence Dark, Rabbi Rose, and David Reinhardt. Uh, good afternoon. One of the cultural things we'll learn is those of us who grew up in black Baptist churches is called call and response. And when someone speaks to you, speak back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, y'all do that real well. Y'all must have visited some of our churches, and even in your own. Um, I'm going to try to keep this to 10 minutes. It's real difficult when you talk about uh, issues important and as timely as this one. Um, so let me use my notes, and forgive me for those of you all who realize that I do better um, off the cuff. I thought I'd better write notes if I'm going to stick to 10 minutes. Uh, first of all, let me thank the City Club um, for sponsoring this and for providing a space and a forum um, around this. As President Clinton has his race initiative, uh, we thought it would be great to have a, a discussion here in Portland. Uh, clearly, we're not the only organization, the City Club and the Urban League, that are concerned about these issues. Uh, other churches, civic organizations, and synagogues are also participating in having discussions. Uh, I need to thank my staff, um, particularly David Brody, uh, who's my special assistant for policy and research, who helped put this together and who's helping me this year uh, as we 
plan more uh, issues around race, around Clinton's initiative with, uh, with a Portland focus, and also thanking my director of marketing, Mike Pullen. I also want to thank Dwayne Bosworth, who is the Urban League board chair, for his support in augmenting and emphasizing advocacy on race relations and diversity. He also chairs the, he is also the chair of the Oregon Bar Diversity Committee. And I need to really thank my multiracial ethnic board of directors and staff who may not always agree on the approach on race relation diversity, but I can tell you, all of them work together for economic self-reliance and social justice for all people. Lastly, I need to thank my best friend and Shiro, my wife, Okima Christian Dark of the U.S. Attorney's Office, who I have the opportunity to have persistent dialogues on race, on class, on gender, on poverty, on economic power. We don't always agree, but we talk and we attempt to work on solutions together. She has written extensively on these issues and lectures nationally on the subject. So first, let me apologize to anyone who says they're all men on the panel. That wasn't intentional. I was just trying to think of some different voices. She probably could have handled this speech better than me. I would highly recommend you read an article that she has written in the Harvard Black Law Journal in the spring of 93 titled, Just My Imagination. You'll remember the Temptation song. Um, I think if you read that, you will get some understandings of some issues as we look at these. I need to also thank my son, or to be upset with him, Harrison Edward, but we'll come back to that later. At the outset, let me say this. I do not speak for all black people in Portland. I do not speak for all black people in Oregon and I do not speak for all black people in the United States. I am only sharing with you my 40 plus years of living in America and the dialogues and conversations I've had with close friends and family members. I will also use some um, books that I um, have been reading over the years that I will recommend to you. Um, the major book I would um, ask you to look at is a book called The Dual Agenda by Donna Cooper Hamilton and Charles V. Hamilton. Um, they looked at 60 years of what these issues have been about from congressional testimonies, from policies, from legislation, from many different points. Their graphs, their charts, their people's words. This is not a book filled with rhetoric. This is a couple who has taken numerous years to write a 60-year history of what these issues are about. I would also recommend a book called Black Power, White Wealth by Claude Anderson. And last, I would also recommend a book called When Work Disappears by William Julius Wilson. All these books are available in your local bookstore. Additionally, on the back table, I don't think we had enough for everyone, but the last issue of the Urban League's newsletter, uh, we took a stab at really looking at race issues. Um, there's a lengthy article by myself and by my wife, and I would highly recommend that you pick one up if there are any available, or get in contact with David to get a copy. Now I will try to start this eight-minute speech. It is utterly exhausting being black in America, physically, mentally, and emotionally. While many minority groups and women feel similar stress, there's no respite or escape from your badge of color. The daily stress of nonstop racial mindfulness and dealing with too many self-centered people who expect you to be cultural and racial translators, and yet feel, neither, yet feel neither the need nor responsibility to reciprocate, to see or hear you as a human being rather than just as a black 
or a woman or a Jew is wearing. It can be exhausting to be a black student on a white college campus or a black employee in a white institution where some assume you are not as smart as comparable whites. The constant burden to prove that you are as smart, as honest, as interesting, as wide gauging, and motivated as any other individual tires you out. As does the need to decide repeatedly whether you will prove to anybody what they have no right to assume or demand. Another book, The Measure of Our Success by Marion Wright Edelman, who was an African American woman married to a Jewish man. So uh, the book she wrote to her sons. I mention this because that kind of sums up some of the ways I feel about living and working in Portland, Oregon. Uh, a little background, um, I was born in America's Georgia, the big city to Plains where Jimmy Carter is from. Grew up in Washington, D.C., but moved here from South Carolina. In Columbia, South, in the state of South Carolina, the state is 30% African American. To move to Portland, Oregon, where there are only 50,000 black people in the entire state. So um, you have to expect it's a little different for those of us who've moved here from somewhere else, from somewhere else. Um, in a community that is overwhelmingly and predominantly white, any discussion about uh, race by African Americans can be overly magnified sometimes. Um, the re when the number of African Americans is so small in a given community, then the problem of isolation and increased vulnerability because of race may cause them to view more situations as racial or potentially racial. The refusal of whites to credit African Americans with the ability to identify situations as racial may be an exercise of white superiority or white supremacy. Meaning, as we go through life here in Portland, those of us who are in such an overwhelming minority experience life differently. Um, a lot of people are always stunned that I like symphony music. Even though James the Priest, who's African American, is in charge of the symphony, they go, oh, you like symphony music? Well, I said, if you grew up in Washington, D.C., you had the National Symphony in your backyard. And they came to our neighborhoods. So why wouldn't I like symphony music or art? Assumptions are made, and I think the reason at the beginning I mentioned those people I did, from my staff to my board to my wife, is because a lot of this depends on relationships and contacts that are persistent, where you get to work through issues together, that I don't have time to try to plan my life and operate in a vacuum. It's only through life experiences. To go back to Harrison, um, why I say either it's a blessing or a curse. I had been the di first director of a state agency in Virginia, the Council on Human Rights, appointed by then Governor Belisles. After two years of that, I just thought it was too political. You couldn't satisfy the black people, you couldn't satisfy the white people, you couldn't satisfy the women, you couldn't satisfy the disabled. Everybody thought their agenda was the most important. So I said, oh well. I've done my public service. Because another thing that I believe what Marion Wright Elliman says is service is the rent we pay for the space we occupy here on earth. Well, I paid my service. It was time to cash in on my Northwestern Law degree. But there, unfortunately, was a race that year between Jesse Helms and Harvey Gantt. Um, Harvey Gantt, being black, had formerly been the mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina was winning in the polls a week before by a huge margin. And we always get accused of pulling the race card, but Jesse Helms did a commercial that's as vivid to me today as it was then. He had a white guy holding a sheet of paper and had rejected across the top. And the commercial said, I would have gotten that job except for affirmative action. The rest is history. I will tell you that it hurt as many white people in North Carolina 
as it did black people. Because it was clearly a multiracial group of people who wanted to get him elected. But he pulled out the race card. So when you want to talk about let's be colorblind, you can choose to be colorblind. I cannot. I am an affirmative action baby. I do not shy away from letting people know that. Um, they have always been smart, intelligent, articulate African Americans. But until someone made a decision to allow it to happen, then I didn't have access. You figure the college I graduated from, Denison University, accepted one black person a year every four years until the 1960s. But if you look at the history of historically black colleges in this country, they have never, ever restricted anyone from attending. You would be surprised if you did your homework in history how many Jews and how many white people attended historically black colleges. So it's ironic that today in Georgia, there is a lawsuit wanting to close historically black colleges because they segregate. So the question for people like me is, you don't want us in white institutions, and you don't want black colleges, so you just want to build prisons. That's where we belong. So as you piece things together in Portland and other places, it's how is it really being impacted? I think <coughs> the greatest thing I can say is Portland possesses a place of opportunity. There are still resources here. Yes, it's beautiful, but the most beautiful thing are the people. And the question comes, how do we treat each other on a daily basis? Uh, Harrison experiences this world the way I like to experience it. As many white kids spend the night at our house, and he goes to as many white parties, and he doesn't see color the way in a negative way. I remember one Christmas we were at a social uh, it was a, a party uh, where people had to color and paint. And Harrison was the only child, there was 100 kids there, primarily black, who painted his Santa Claus black with a brown beard because it looks like me. Is it race conscious that he paints pictures that looks like him? Or when you come in my home, you see lots of black art so Harrison will be able to deal with the world it's not when someone's going to discriminate against him or be racist toward him. It's when. I would be less than a parent not to prepare him for the pains and shocks that he's going to have to endure, no matter how smart, how intelligent, how articulate, or how uh, rich he can be. Let me end with this poem because there are many other things I could say, but I think this poem kind of sums up some of it, and I do better with questions. The cold within. Six humans trapped by happenstance in black and bitter cold. Each one possess a stick of wood, or so the story's told. Their dying fire in need of logs, the first woman held hers back. For on the faces round the fire, she noticed one was black. The next man looking across the way saw one not of his church, and couldn't bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The third one sat in tattered clothes. He gave his coat a hitch. Why should his log be put to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how to keep what he had, heard, had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from his sight, for all he saw in the stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. And the last man of this forlorn group did not accept for game, giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. The logs held in tight in deaf still hands was proof of human sin. They died, they didn't die from the cold without, they died from the cold within. I'm an affirmative action baby. My wife was an affirmative action baby. But we pay taxes, we contribute to society. What can an affirmative action baby do? I thought my wife was kind of suicidal, but she took the New Jersey bar and the Pennsylvania bar at the same time. She passed them on the objective parts, 
not the essay parts. There were thousands of white people who had higher scores than her who failed the bar the first, second, and third time. So all we needed was an opportunity to get in and compete, and we have. And I think here in Portland, what I get concerned about, there are many talented, gifted African-American students who are leaving the state. They were born and raised here and contribute so much, but they don't come back. The question becomes, what do we need to do as a community to welcome them back? And I think we can do it. Thank you. When Fran, uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here again. I have been here a few times over the years. Uh, and I've been a member in and out of City, City Club also over the years. Uh, but Friday is, is, is just about the worst day for a rabbi. So I decided to finally quit and just call the City Club anti-Semitic. <laughs> Fr <laughs> Fran, when you introduced uh, David as a conservative uh, columnist, uh, an image flashed across my mind when I was on this podium once with Fred Stickle, and he was way over on the left. He was at the left. So I said, this is the first time that Fred Stickle was ever introduced on being on the left of anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have to comment, Lawrence, as far as that black woman marrying a Jewish man, if they had come to me for counseling beforehand, I just would have asked them, you need this problem too? <laughs> Last Saturday night, I had an opportunity to address the American Leadership Forum annual meeting, and it was an honor for me to be able to do that. And the address encompassed the following thoughts that there has never been any nation in the history of the world like America, that there is a tremendous reservoir of poetry portraying the dream, that the poetry which portrays the dream of America has been replaced by a gnawing, dangerous, and destructive sense of cynicism, and that we need to reconstruct the dream and what it has meant in the lives of millions upon millions of people and their descendants that it is still an achievable dream, and our commitment to it requires of us in all our educational endeavors, in our programs, in our speech, the need to demonstrate that the dream can become reality. Now let me subdue my normal state of humility by telling you <laughs> that even Lorraine, my wife, thought it was an excellent address. <laughs> This line is a segue to my observation that the few Native Americans and African Americans who are part of our ALF were the most demonstrably appreciative of my words that night. I've thought about their particular reactions and have pondered the thought that these people, all superb achievers, understood intellectually, but far more important, emotionally felt the poetry of this great country. They had all overcome, for whatever reasons in their backgrounds, the barriers that might well have blocked their entrance into mainstream American life. Therefore, they have a sense of ownership of America. Now, admittedly, there are a variety of wonderful and even incredible programs which take place in our community and they are literally saving lives and opening up possibilities for those few who are given the opportunity of perhaps receiving, perceiving an American dream way out there on the horizon. Also, there are some individuals in our community who personally do unheralded but amazing things for others. A handful here, a club here and there, a few classes here and there, some mentoring programs, some reading programs, businesses operating a variety of training programs, all beautiful endeavors which will create a lighted pathway for those involved. Now, in no way do I wish to 
trivialize what is being done. They are truly life-saving programs. And many individuals and businesses are dedicating enormous time and resources, and sometimes all of their life energies to them. And I understand that there are many people in our community who are anxious to do things on all ends of the political spectrum, but are at a loss to know what to do. The question is this, however. Do we as a society do what we need to do to make it possible for the racial minorities in this country to have the possibility of acquiring a sense of ownership in this country? It was about a year and a half ago that the mayor called together a group of religious leaders in an appeal to be prepared to do more than had ever been done to help the underclasses of our community as a result of changes being made in Washington. I know how well intended that meeting was, but I was overwhelmed when considering the reality, or I should say unreality, of the appeal. Outside of some relatively small circles, Portland is not an overtly bigoted community. But in fact, there is a lot of racism in our community. The kind I refer to is out there in the general culture, always looming in the background. And it's going to take a long time to over overcome that culture. And it's a chicken and egg situation. There's no way to overcome the cultural problem as long as the conditions remain which make it extremely difficult for racial minorities to enter into mainstream America. Contemporary political rhetoric, the caricatures that that rhetoric has attempted to create, has only complicated the problem. And what should be of greatest concern to us all, because most of us are guilty of it, including myself, is the essential broad indifference to the terrible suffering and economic deprivation of the underclasses in American society. We may say, oh my God, that's terrible. My heart goes out to whatever. What we have in our community is a broad gap with relatively little going on in the way of building the bridges necessary to truly confront our terrible social and economic divide. There is always lots of discussion in meetings, but I don't believe that very much is happening on a broad scale, which is having any kind of powerful impact on entire communities. If we are truly interested in the state of race relations, we need to be able to hear words such as the following selected sentences which appeared in the December 10th issue of the Portland Observer. The article is entitled, My Christ Christmas Wish List. An introduction contains the following words. This has been one of the most difficult years for me. A year when I have seen issues which are important to me and to my people under vicious attacks. Now skipping down her wish list. My fifth wish is that our nation will reach beyond the political rhetoric and come to understand that to end affirmative action will not only be bad for communities of color, but will be bad for the whole nation. My wish is that those of us who have benefited the most directly from affirmative action over the past generation, women of all colors, men of color, will tell our stories and help others to understand the positive impact for everyone, or we will find affirmative action dying state by state. My sixth wish is that every child in this nation would have access to health care and quality education and housing and food. My ninth wish is that somehow we can reach beyond the political machinations, beyond the personal blinders, beyond the historical miseducation, and beyond the institutional barriers, and really end racism in my lifetime. What else is there? Now, I think that you and I know 
<clears throat> excuse me, that Martin Luther King's dream eludes us. So long as his dream is smoke, so too is the American dream smoke. There is suspicion and fear between communities. The gang issue is a nightmare. The public educational system is challenged, and without education, forget it all. I recently heard that most of the textbooks in our school are somewhere between seven and 12 years old at a time when our information is doubling every eight years. Without decent economic opportunities, forget it all. Blacks are with blacks, Hispanics are with Hispanics, whites are with whites. There is lots of talk, there have been lots of conferences, there are simply no all-encompassing strategies. Something dramatic needs to be done. We are living through an American tragedy, and nothing really powerful is happening. I do believe that while there is bigotry, we are as free of it in this part of the country as anywhere else. I believe that we, unlike many large cities, can still get our racial problems under control. What we should perhaps encourage is not another theoretical conference, but a major decision to bring together an array of people, brilliant minds, to design a massive, all-encompassing assault on the social, educational, economic, aspects of this endemic American tragedy, to bring together the funds that need to be utilized to do it. If we can fund, and by the way, I don't think it should re be run by government, I think it should be organized by business. If we cannot, f if we can afford to fund wars in Iraq, we can find the resources to fight the wars on our streets. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's really an honor to be on this stage with uh, Mr. Dark and Rabbi Rose. Uh, it's good to be at the City Club. The only th I've never been at one of your gatherings, though I've written plenty of critical things about the City Club on occasion. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, some of them have even been mentioned here today. There's a, we have a lot in common here, and I, I, Rabbi Rose said that this is the worst day of the week to be a rabbi on and do some extracurricular things. Well, as a columnist with a Sunday column and a deadline of 2.30 on my Sunday column, 2.30 Friday, it's one of the worst days for me. And, uh, we also share some things in common. Lawrence, uh, I'm the only conservative on the Oregonian editorial page. So. <laughs> uh, but I do salute Lawrence for what he did today, for bringing this thing uh, before us, for, uh, for getting this off the ground. It's, uh, I think there's no important topic in the United States right now than we can talk about, than the issue of race in this, con in, in this country. Uh, I was very optimistic about President Clinton's conversation on race, and I think we're off to a better start here today than President Clinton has gotten off to with what looks like a very insincere conversation. It looks like a, uh, it, it looks like a uh, staging ground for sound bites, and, and we've seen it. Uh, there have not been any conservatives or, or white people, in fact, invited to some of the uh, sessions that President Clinton uh, has, has organized. I think that's scandalous. Uh, we all saw, uh, I think it was last uh, Thursday, where President Clinton basically set up uh, Abigail Thornstrom, one of the uh, most uh, eminent uh, uh, scholars uh, with respect to race relations in America with respect to affirmative action. 
and, and basically he treated her as if she were a guest on the McLaughlin sh group show. Yes or no, Abigail? Uh, racial harmony or racial hatred? Well, we haven't had that here today, and we've had a lot more balance. I mean, basically one-third of the panel is, uh, represents a card-carrying conservative who opposes uh, a system of racial preferences that we have, we have seen uh, grow up over the last uh, uh, two decades. The, what we need, I think, rather, is kind of almost the wisdom of an Abraham Lincoln, the courage and grace of an Abraham Lincoln, and yet in President Clinton's conversation, we seem to have uh, gotten the uh, night bellhop at the Lincoln bedroom. Uh, this is just not, this is just not what we, what we need. Uh, what we need too is a lowering of voices and honest talk. Lowering of voices is hard for me. I think it's an occupational problem that comes with being a columnist. Honest talk, however, is is not, and it's been my passion for the last. I'd say five years to talk honestly with people of all colors about my feelings on, on, on race in this country. It is the hardest thing that you can do, uh, talking to a colleague of, of another color and talking to another person of color and talking honestly, not clamming up as so many white people do. There, is, there, is, there seems to be two styles among white people when they talk about the issue of race. That is, to either clam up and say nothing, fearing they will be called racists, or to enter into uh, to chatter that's almost uh, condescending. And I've, I believe that it's time to break through that. Uh, so here we, here we go. Uh, do I believe there's racism? in Portland, Oregon, and across the United States? You bet I do. I've heard it. I've heard it from white people. I've heard it from white neighbors. I've heard it from peop uh, white uh, uh, folks who call in uh, in response to a column or an editorial. It's out there. I don't think it's as great as it once was. In fact, I know th that it isn't as great as it once was. The public opinion polls bear this out. Everything we know about what's going on in this country bears that out. But it does, it does exist. I've heard the poison. I've, I've seen the poison at an earlier point in my life. I've seen it in, uh, I've also heard that the, uh, the anecdotes the, the words, the stories from my black colleagues. And they are real, and I take them seriously. They are real anecdotes, and they are, in some cases, real slights. In other cases, however, I think they are perceived slights. That doesn't make them any less important. That doesn't make them any less worthy of being talked about. But talking about them involves a two-way conversation. I give you two, two examples. A couple of weeks ago, we ran an editorial about a situation at Mount Hood Community College. And in the editorial, which I wrote, we uh, suggested that uh, people who were going to be in the uh, uh, English as a Second Language program be uh, asked for ID because there were, there were some uh, uh, illegal immigrants who were taking up spaces that would go to legal immigrants in these programs, and we just didn't think that was right. A day later, I received, or the, the, our, our, our editorial group received a very sharp and punchy uh, email from one of the uh, black uh, team leaders in our, our group who's constantly looking over what we do and, and often provides great uh, criti criticism of it. And he said, he was opposed to the editorial, and he, said, he, he, he told the group that how, how angry he was and how irked he was whenever he was asked for a, uh, a bit of ID when he went and cashed a check. Uh, he was asked for a source of ID, sometimes two. 
and I'm never one to uh, turn down an invitation to debate, and I wrote him and the group back, and to the effect that I too was asked for a, uh, a, a ID on occasion, and I didn't take it as a as as an indication that the, the store owner or whoever was upset with my Euro-American background. I just took it as an uh, as a as a sign that we live, alas, in a fallen world, and people are trying to get over on other people. He responded back. Okay, yeah, that's fine, that makes sense. And I think that happens a lot. And I can see why it happens. I can see why it happens because that those slights are real, but not all of them are real. Moreover, I think those slights and those problems are not remedied to any great extent by more government. They are, prob they are, they are more, more than anything else problems of the heart. And like so many areas in our our uh, our life, these these problems uh, these problems will only be taken care of by a change of heart. That's slow. It's agonizing. It's painful. But that's I think uh, the way it is, and that's where we're headed. Uh, the other example. There are a number of people who, and, 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 and some of them I hold in high respect, Ron Herndon is one of them, who look at the situation up at uh, uh, the, the school in North Portland, uh, Humboldt, and say, this is a result of white teachers basically not expecting enough of black uh, black students. They, 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 they set low expectations for them. I believe that's I believe that's true. I believe the, the teachers up at, uh, at Humboldt weren't expecting enough of their, of their students. Is that a black problem? Maybe in part it is. But I can tell you, I just recently received a call from a, from a, a, a parent who's representing a group of parents in southeast uh, Oregon, uh, in southeast Portland. No black students, or no, not, not an appreciable group of black black students, a number of, of lower class uh, white. And their complaint, her complaint was that the administration of this school, the principal and, and some of the, uh, high, the administrative people were flat out told them, don't expect anything from your kids because they're lower, they're lower class and they're not going anywhere and you got all kinds of social problems. It works both ways, and I think we need to talk about that. I need to hear from Lawrence about those slights. I need to hear about how, what a burden it is, and I, I, I want to hear it. I want him to hear from me sometimes, and he doesn't have to agree with me, that it works both ways. There's more that unites us in some ways than, than divides us. Where I think there's the most race-ism, race consciousness going on is in the officially sanctioned, the governmentally sanctioned uh, racism of, affirm of affirmative action programs that take the form, not all affirmative action programs, but affirmative action programs that take the form of race-based preferences, race-based timetables, anything that sorts out people according to race or according to gender. Rabbi Rose, would you be able to hand me my water there? I'm just losing it here. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm speaking, I'm lowering my voice. Can you imagine? Uh, I'm not sure I want to give you that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is I thought you wanted to celebrate diversity here. Come on. I cannot tell you the kind of ill will that these programs generate. I cannot, uh, th we see this, we see this in, in polling data. We see, we see it, uh, you, you see it anecdotally. It, they are causing a, a lot of ill will among people who do not consider themselves racists. These are people who have been weaned on Martin Luther King's dream. They are people who have been weaned on Sesame Street 
and believe in their hearts that they are not racists and they are they they are they, you are cause I, I think these programs are causing a race consciousness elevating a race consciousness among them that wouldn't be there but for these affirmative uh, these uh, racial preference pr racial preference programs I think this is the same thing is happening with the uh, racial sensitivity training and the re-education camps that that people are forced into involuntary uh, I'm not opposed to the voluntary ones but you know as well as I do there are involuntary ones going on right now planned for the coming year even and they I, I believe this, that their, their, their main upshot is to create more dissension than you would otherwise have. Now these people that I'm talking about and talking for, they don't, they, they're not going to speak up at these sensitivity training. Oh, they might roll their eyes or look meaningful at an, uh, meaningfully at another colleague, but they're not going to speak up. And they're not going to come to forums like this and speak up. They're, gonna, they're afraid they're going to be called a racist, which is the, one of the worst things, even after, after it's long, you know, it's overuse, is one of the worst things you want to be called. I kind of don't mind. I mean, I'd be called Nazi, worse. And so it doesn't bother me, but there are a lot of people, businessmen especially, who just don't need the grief. And they don't show up at these sessions. They don't show up at the sensitivity sessions. But one thing they do do is they vote. And they are voting increasingly for candidates who want to rein in these racial preference programs. They are they are voting increasingly and will vote increasingly for uh, resolutions or uh, ballot measures that rein in these programs. Fortunately, the, state, the, the, the court has recently moved in to rein in some of these programs. And right now, we're, a, we're in a period which I liken to the period after Brown versus the Board of Education. The establishment of this day is hunkered down trying to defend a program that I think is constitutionally and creedally indefensible. We are involved in a period of massive resistance and we'll work ourselves through, through that. Does this mean we'll see the end of affirmative action properly understood? I don't think so and I hope not. Properly understood as originally introduced, affirmative action involved casting a wide net, opening up opportunities, letting people know better recruitment. I am all for that. I am not for these group preference programs. And there are 160 of them almost in the federal government. The nation's universities are full of them. And uh, little by little, they will be, I think they will come to a halt. Will this mean the end of black progress or will it mean that black uh, blacks uh, are, are involved in a, the, the, that there will be a period of black decline? I don't think so. If you read the recent book of Abigail Thernstrom and her husband, uh, uh, Stephen Thernstrom, Har uh, who himself is a Harvard historian, you will see that black progress took place in this country at a far greater pace in the 1940s and 50s than it even has in the period of the civil rights movement and in the period of, of, uh, of the, affirmative the affirmative action era that basically began in the early 70s. That's, so we, it's, black progress is not as fragile uh, and not as dependent on affirmative action as uh, we have been led to believe. I think if we can move beyond this, if we can move beyond this debate that's tearing us apart, over uh, race preference programs. We can then move on and look at problems that affect us all, but affect black people in this country in some measures worse. The education system, the employment situation, the matter of families and illegitimacy in this country. The Urban League has done great work in the, in the area, in some of those areas, but we need to all 
all look at that because they, these things, rather than an inherent white racism, underlie so many of these problems. And they will unite us because they affect blacks, whites, and other, and other groups in this country. A final anecdote of my own. I have a friend in the newsroom. I consider him a friend. We have a charged relationship. He's black, and he's very, uh, he, he's a lot like I am. Very uh, vocal, very uh, ready, to, ready to fight, ready to, ready to go back and forth, and we constantly do on issues of, of race. And sometimes I can tell you that it's more pleasant, sometimes are more pleasant than other uh, times. And sometimes it get, becomes very, very charged. One day, recently, I had a column to write. And it was on an issue that wasn't a racial issue. It was on an issue that he had done a lot of good reporting. And I went out into the newsroom, put my battle helmet on, and went out into the newsroom. And I was approached his desk, and he good-naturedly gave me the uh, international sign of uh, goodwill. And uh, once he discovered what I was interested in and what I was going to be writing on, he, uh, he took an hour of his time, and he's a busy guy, sat down with me, we traded information, we swapped insights on this, and for an hour more, we both forgot what race we were. We weren't talking about issues, and it was good. It was fresh, and I thought how unusual it, it was. We shared our indignation over this, public, over this public issue, and it was wonderful. I hope we can get on to that kind of situation in a larger sense in this country, because like you, Lawrence, I'm tired of this debate. I'm very tired of it. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists for coming today, and I hope that you'll be able to spend time and come back at future luncheons. Racism in Portland, I do believe it is a reality, it is an opportunity, and it's a challenge. And my question for our panelists today stems from this. What are the keys to bridging the cultural divides in our community? Everybody's looking at me, so I'll talk. <laughs> um, one of the things the, the Urban League has been engaged in locally and nationally, um, but locally I'll talk about Portland. Um, my board went through about an eight month <clears throat> analysis of what does the Urban League stand for? Um, and it's not easy because we have uh, probably one of the most diverse organizations doing diverse work in the community. Uh, one of the things the book I mentioned, Dual Agenda, Dual Agenda, talks about is all too often people think that organizations like ours were only concerned with black issues. Organizations like ours have always been concerned about issues of equality for all people. But unfortunately, it gets cast that we're only concerned about issues dealing with people of color. Uh, we decided that uh, our mission would be to assist African Americans and all who strive toward economic self-reliance and social equality. Uh, and then to implement that. Just because we emphasize African Americans doesn't mean if you come in our building, for our services. We have never denied anyone. That has never been the history of an Urban League. Uh, and I think that the main thing we have to do is we have said we will concentrate on education and employment equality. That those three intersect and that it requires all of us working on those issues. Uh, like David Reinhardt, we might not agree how to get there, but we know those are important issues. And I think what we have to do is find things that are, are uh, issues like that that concern all people and, and really um, find ways to honor and respect the intelligence, um, the life experiences, uh, the research and data um, as we go about doing this work. We, we can no longer say, you're from this part of the river, you're from southwest, you're from northeast, because I live in northeast Portland, and there are lots of people like me in northeast Portland who have law degrees, who have medical degrees. But somehow, when it gets reported in the newspaper, you would think all the dreads of society live in Northeast Portland. And I think that that's the kind of images we have to change and work on is what kind of images are put out by the media, um, by politicians, and do we play into them? 
There's a saying that says, tell the people what they want to hear and they will believe it. Unfortunately, that was Adolf Hitler. Uh, briefly, um, only a major assault on the education uh, problems and then coupled with economic opportunity, the problems related to that on a massive scale, will bring minority communities into mainstream America. And that will happen before racism is eliminated from the culture. In other words, those changes need to take place. Then there is a mixing of peoples, and little by little it begins to drain out of the population. But it's going to be more lasting in the culture uh, even after, God willing, if I can use the word God at the city club, uh, <laughs> It'll be, <laughs> uh, it'll be more lasting in, in, in the culture uh, than um, um, even after these problems one day hopefully will be solved. I agree with much of that. I think we have got to continue and should continue in a post-affirmative action era to come down hard on cases, individual cases of, of, of uh, racial discrimination, whether it be in housing or employment. There should be tr tremendous punishments. There should be remedial action that involves, that will involve racial quotas, where there are cases uh, specific of, of uh, racial discrimination. We do have, I think Rabbi Rose is right, we've got to tackle the educational problem. This, if you look at, at, at the statistics, this is what really accounts for the great income gap in this country. It is a matter largely of, uh, of, of the gap uh, in, in basic skills uh, that, that exists between blacks and whites, particularly black, black males in this country and white, and white males. We have got to go after that. It's not an easy task. I don't think it's a task that is necessarily uh, a, a matter of money, uh, but that's got to be, that's got to be addressed. That'll help you know, the, the economic, uh, the jobs issue. And just let me add, um, we, we often hear that, that, that if, if blacks, Hispanics get education, that we will have total access now, let's be realistic. A lot of people who are hiring make decisions. Uh, I don't care if I had 15 degrees from Harvard and Stanford and Oxford, there's no guarantee, and of course there are no guarantees, that I'll be given a fair shake. I mean, it's just the way it is in America. Uh, and I will say this part. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories that some of my friends get tired of hearing, but who can tell me the largest affirmative action program this country's ever had? The military. The primary beneficiaries of that were white men from places like Oregon who didn't have degrees and didn't have access that allowed them to get degrees. Because at the time it was written, most of the people in the military were not women and not people of color. Now who wrote the legislation? Adam Clayton Powell, a black man. Again, he wrote it for all Americans. And the story keeps being told that the only people who benefit from affirmative action are black people, and that is absolutely not true. I'm Arnold Kogan, member of the City Club, and I have a question that's related to the education discussion that uh, was just begun here. Uh, one of my granddaughters is an African-American student at Grand High School. And she is in the honors program in both English and Latin. Uh, she participates in a new Urban League program for uh, motivated youth. And the problem that she's found is that many of her fellow African American students have lacked a home or a school environment which emphasizes excellence in education. What do the three of you think could be done or should be done to help these young people? Okay, uh, I'm going to repeat what I closed with, that I think we have to once and for all take this problem on with total, total seriousness. It is an American tragedy. I would like to see the kind of an approach that I suggested. Uh, part of that approach would encompass 
the question that you're talking about. And these pop shot answers that, you know, they're just not doing it. They're just not doing it. We better admit it and face up to it. Decide if we're gonna deal with it or just say the heck with it. I think you've pinpointed a real, a real problem and I'm not, sh I, I'm not quite sure how it is addressed. It is a, uh, the, the, the problem of uh, a kind of discounting, a peer pressure discounting of education that happens in the black community is, it, it is a special problem in the black community. I think it is a growing problem uh, in, in American culture, culture generally. Uh, the, the, some of the Asian kids who come here do well. If, if, if they fall off, their peers say, you're becoming an American, which is a tremendous indictment. I think it's a true indictment of what's going on in American culture. I'm not sure how you, uh, how you, you, you solve it, uh, but I'm going to pass it off to Lawrence for that. Um, one of the things we have working nationally is something called the Campaign for Academic um, Excellence for African American Youth. And uh, our national president, Hugh Price, who will be here in March to talk about this and other issues, has really pinpointed, along with many people, that we have to work on this. Uh, Kawanza Kajufu wrote a book a couple years ago, To Be Popular, To Be Smart. Um, and it talked about that there, there is an issue of whether some um, black kids and African American kids think it's um, acting white or being gay or lesbian, being smart, and we don't know where that came from, but we as a community, that's blacks, whites, Jews, gays and lesbians, all of us who believe in education have got to work on it together. So um, the Campaign for Academic Excellence and Achievement for African American Youth is something that the Portland Urban League is taking up, and that's why we're working on this grant um, program, leadership program, um, with the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice, Weed and Seed, which um, Okima happens to run. That doesn't mean we got the money because of her. We, we, we're competitive. Um, but if we don't take this up together, and there's work we have to do in the African American community. I'm not gonna say it's a white issue um, by itself. It's an issue of people really saying that this is how, what we believe in, and, but we're gonna have to be supportive and make sure the school systems can handle diverse students. Uh, uh, one of the things we had to do with, is my son Harrison is active, but some people will see a black kid and say that they're out of control and should be put on Ritalin. Unfortunately, when you come at, at me and someone like Okima with those kind of assumptions about our kids, then we have uh, less than respect and disdain for a school system supposed to be, supposed to be um, educating and respectful for all people. So if we don't find ways to make sure those teachers and administrators, whether they're black, white, poor, or whatever, who are entrusted with our kids, and the parents and community must also stand up and say that academic excellence is just as important as shooting basketball and football. I'm afraid we need to stop, unfortunately. And I do want to stop, thank very much uh, the three incredibly provocative panelists that have spoken with us today. Uh, I would certainly like to thank David Reinhart for coming and for his candid remarks. I would also like to volunteer to write his upcoming editorial for him and any other editorials that he feels <laughs> nervous about in the future. Uh, Rabbi Rose, I want you to know that the City Club is completely over its anti-Semitism and we hope that you will join again soon. And uh, Lawrence Dark, uh, we thank you very much for uh, helping lead us uh, in many of these issues. We pray you will stay with us in Portland and continue to help us struggle with this incredibly important issue of race relations. Thank you all for coming. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.